Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jess. And uh, hello, John. Uh, Hi, Craig. Yeah, we're very much looking forward to uh, this conversation and um, and uh, you're sharing decades of uh, accumulated wisdom in different ways. I'll just say a few words by way of uh, introduction um, for those of you um, uh, on the call today may not be um, uh, aware of John's uh, fantastic work over a long time. Associate Professor John Bradley has worked closely with Indigenous communities in Northern Australia and been a scholar with the Monash Indigenous Studies Centre for decades. He's a foremost expert on Indigenous languages, law and social structures, and has written and taught widely on those topics. He's uh, also been a serious uh, Buddhist practitioner in the Vajrayana tradition with a deep interest in meditation for the last 40 years. So we're gonna be exploring some of uh, the insights into meditation, meaning in the mind, and explore some of these sort of intersecting threads and strands from different wisdom traditions. So welcome, John, it's good to be with you. Okay, thank you, Craig. Let's see how we go. <laughs> yes, and you're uh, soon to head off again on one of your regular um, yeah, I'm... trips to uh, Northern Australia. Yeah, on the 10th, I'm going away for a month, no phone, no computer, and yeah, it'll be good. <laughs> uh, good. I, I'm not sure if it's the pursuit of wisdom that takes you there or perhaps the escaping the Melbourne cold weather, but it uh, could be a bit of both. <laughs> it could be a bit of both. Lots of memories. It's like a second home. That part of the, well, you know, that specific part of the Northern Territory is where I arrived when I was 19 years old as a primary school teacher back in the day. So um, there's a lot of memories there. And I'm, you know, now working with the grandchildren, great grandchildren, and great great grandchildren of the people that first taught me. Yeah, fantastic. So I'd be really interested to hear a little bit about what was the catalyst for this sort of lifelong interest in, in uh, Indigenous um, languages and, and wisdom. How did it all start for you? Uh, well, I'm going to blame my dad. Um, I grew up <laughs> on a farm, uh, which is on Tangorong country in central Victoria. And my dad had a very deep interest in the Indigenous presence on that country. Um, he knew where the canoe, the bark canoe trees were. He knew where the shield trees were. He knew where the ground ovens were. When he plowed, he dug up axes. He once tried to take some to the museum. He was so horrified with what the museum did to them. He said, well, they can just stay on this country. Um, so as a kid, we just grew up with this strong understanding of these things. And then when I was about 13 or 14, he gave me a book to read by Frank Hardy on the Gurindji walk-off and sort of said, well, if you want to know anything about this country um, and Australia and Indigenous relations, start here. And I think it sparked an interest. And well, I, I did a teaching degree which specialised because I had a Commonwealth, Commonwealth scholarship that took me to the Northern Territory, took me to Borolula, where I still work today. So that's 45 years ago now. So there's that. And I think the Buddhist also, my, I will blame my father by default in that he was a man interested in history. And I remember asking him once what happened in the year I was born. And he said, well, and he thought about it, thought about it, thought about it. And then he said, and he told me the whole story of the Dalai Lama escape from over the Himalayas. And I was a bit blown away by this whole idea of a monk that I didn't really know what a monk was, but the Himalayas, I knew what it was. And so I started to research who was the Dalai Lama, what was Tibet, what was any of this. So in some respects, the two have traveled in tandem all my life, intersecting, going different ways, but the older I get, the more they come together. Yeah. We're going to hear more about the ways in which that's unfolded um, for you, but you have a particular interest in languages um, and, and also preserving languages. I mean, it's enough to learn a language and so on, but I suspect it's a few orders of magnitude uh, more complex to um, help preserve these languages. Could you tell us a little bit about that work and, and why that's such an important body yeah. of work for you? So I was always interested in languages. Um, even as a kid, you know, I had, I studied German alone, then went for German lessons, uh, Hebrew. I studied Hebrew, had Hebrew lessons. Um, then I arrive in a remote community called Borolula, and I remember going 
out bush with a whole heap of families. There would have been about 60 people, I think. And there wasn't a word of English being spoken. And this was my first real exposure to Indigenous languages. And I thought, at that time, I thought, wow, I nearly need a passport to be on this country. I had no idea what was going on. And I met very generous teachers, um, Yanua people in particular, who basically said, well, you want to learn this language? You can. So I did. Um, over many years, I, I studied that language. And I think the thing that holds me to it both personally and professionally is that not much is ever said about Indigenous languages, really. Not many people know much about them. They're a, a voice of Australia, a really powerful voice of Australia. They belong to Australia. I often think when you get back into, say, Yanua country and you're talking Yanua, it's like you're amplifying something that is already very present in that place. It lives there. It belongs there. The vocabulary belongs to that country. Like living in Melbourne, there is so much in Yanua you can't talk about because the vocabulary doesn't match the environment. So I was... I've been really interested in even just that process, the process of working with oral traditions, traditions that have never been written before. How do you actually do that successfully, I think is still really a, a, a problematic journey because the moment you translate, you have altered forever an oral tradition. The moment you put English punctuation into things, you, uh, you begin to colonize the text. So there are really big issues about that, but at the same time, so many of these languages are in such perilous, perilous states. Like, you know, 45 years ago, there were over 360 speakers of Yanua. Today, there are three, and I'm one of them. So this says something about Australia. It says something about the, about, in many respects, indigenous health and well-being. It says a lot about education in remote communities. So there's a whole lot of things that conspire and have conspired to mean that languages are in decline. So, for example, when I was 19, I arrived in this community. The principal and his wife had been there for uh, 13, 14 years, and their policy was still then to punish any child that spoke their language. So you saw it in action. So, you know, I can speak Yanua very, very well. I can speak the neighboring language, Garua. I used to be able to hear Mara, but there are no Mara speakers left at all. It's a language that's gone. So for me, the entanglement of myself in that community and language sort of just developed over the years. I never had an intention that I was going to write an encyclopedia on the language. I never had an intention that I would use animation as a way of trying to preserve the orality and the visuals of that language, but that's how it's worked out. Can you say more about that, the, the animations, the, the ways in which uh, language can be brought alive and, and related to, to community, to land and so on? Can you tell us more about how you've gone about doing that? Well, I thought about... For many years, I was thinking about, because you're dealing with this notion of orality and oral traditions and these oral traditions that are so linked to country and to ancestors, both human and non-human. Um, and I, animation was always in the back of my mind. And I remember buying blocks of plasticine once to do, just muck around with stop-start animation. And I just gave up. That's not my skill set. It's just not what I can do. But my first ever long service leave when I was at the University of Queensland, I spent doing storyboards for all the stories I'd ever been told by Yanua elders. Um, the dean at the time thought it was a horrific act and shouldn't really be counted as long service leave. Um, and then I was rescued um, from UQ by Professor Lynette Russell, ended up at the Monash Indigenous Studies Centre. Um, in six, I was there six months when I met Brent McKee from IT at Monash who, and Tom Chandler, who basically asked a very simple question. Have you got anything that you would like animated? And it was like, I'm ready for this. Let's do this. <laughs> and um, we began. We began, of course, with the annual stuff because it was all there. And I remember seeing the first animations as, you know, as 
primitive as they are now, but they're still quite beautiful. But it started a process where other Indigenous communities all around Australia started to say, well, can you do this for us? And that was a, a part of the long-term processes that have been involved in Monash. Because what you can do with it is a number of things. One is you can resurrect languages that haven't been spoken perhaps for 80 or 90 years. With a lot of work, you can do that. So people in Southern Australia, where colonization has been its most fiercest, can work to resurrect their ancestral languages. In other parts of Australia, you are still dealing with people who speak their languages, knowing that those languages may not be spoken. So all in all, it's a way of keeping a reality alive, but matching it to the country to which the language belongs. So if you see the animations, for example, the Tangorong animations or the Gunditjmara animations from Victoria have a very Victorian light about them, a very, uh, they belong to the country. It, you can see they're not of the North. Whereas if you look at the Northern ones, the light is different. There's a quality that's different to them. So it enabled us to use language in an oral form as it should be, as it always was, but to also create the country to which those languages belong. Because those those things are so inseparable, and and perhaps um, and please forgive me if these are naive questions, but in terms of a language being revitalised, is it a, a challenge for perhaps a generation who might be starting to lose their tradition and the law and so on? Is is it a challenge to rekindle that interest? in language or is that something that's really happening through education you know changing you know decolonizing the education for children brought up in in those areas how, how can the language be revitalized if it's still there um in terms of knowing what it is 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 that a possibility look i think it's a whole lot of what you've said but i think it's actually much more personal too i think from my own experience, you have Indigenous peoples who just say, look, what did our old people speak? And there's been formidable work done by people in Victoria, Koori scholars, who have combed the archives to find every word that has ever been recorded about their languages. So it wouldn't be, it's not a stretch of the imagination, though, to also put here that there's a lot of post-traumatic stress going on at the same time because you're trying to revitalize, rekindle things that were forcibly removed from ancestors. And then you're wanting to bring it back into a form of use, which takes a heck of a long time. Like, I think if you look around Australia, when a language no longer is being spoken, it really takes four to five generations before there's movement again to try and really bring it back. Like, I know work I'm doing at Borrelulu at the moment with young men and women, when I say young, they're in their 30s. They're not that interested in language at the moment. What they're interested in is how can what has been recorded by their grandparents and great-grandparents be put into a form that is useful to them today? And that might be um, English, of course. And, you know, it's not lost on people. I remember working with old people who once said to me, if we want to preserve our culture, our languages, our traditions, we all have to become fluent in English. And I think that's a, a powerful statement about recognizing and understanding the force of colonization. So, you know, at the moment, if I look at what I'm working at at the moment, one of my deep and abiding interests over the last 30 years probably has been the tradition of song lines traveling through country, you know, musical chanted traditions about country and about non-human kin and all sorts of things like this. And, you know, they're all recorded. They've all been commentated upon in language. But young people, they look at language where I work, at least. They're looking at language and going, look, we just don't have the time. So how can we access this? So basically, I've spent the last three years writing augmented poetry in English as a way of trying to keep these song lines in a form that makes sense and in a way that young people want to work with them. And it's actually been quite 
astounding uh, as to what these young people, younger people, have done with these augmented poems that are actually in English. Yes, it'll be fascinating to see what form that takes when new generations take it yeah. on and <clears throat> make That's something still, their own. I think in the end, from my perspective, especially working with Yanua, I've spent a lot of time sowing seeds, but I probably won't live to see what happens to those seeds. Uh, it's just an impossibility. You know, communities that are under a lot of stress still, um, you know, sometimes the very act of wanting to engage with language or culture or law is actually a luxury. When there are so many other important things that have to be done on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, even in my lifetime, even in my life, 45 years, the change has been absolutely at one level alarming. We're also interested in, in the wisdom embodied uh, in the tradition as well. I've heard somebody saying about Sanskrit that so much of the law and the wisdom is actually embodied in the language yeah. itself. Is it the same in the indigenous traditions as well? And, and bearing in mind, there are so many, as you noted before, so many different languages. Is it is the the wisdom embodied in the language as well? And and if so, can you give us some examples yeah. of, of Look, how that it is, expresses it's itself? It's a critical point. Language is the holder of this. And I'm only going to talk for Yanua here. I'm not making any profession to speak wider than that. That's the world that I have occupied intimately for 45 years. It's the language I speak, so maybe I know a little bit. But look, just to give you one example, and we know from linguistic studies, I'm sort of moving backwards and then I'll come forward, that this is the case. Indigenous languages, or Yanua in this case, are full of rich semantic domains. That is, bodies of words that encompass a whole lot of knowledge about one thing. So just briefly, in Yanua, for example, if we want to talk about family and understandings of family, there are over 180 different words just to talk about family. You know, it, it beggars, really, when you get into the detail of this. But to probably give you a more pragmatic example, like and this was part of my PhD studies, actually, Yanua people are saltwater people. They're marine people. They hunt jugong. Well, English has one word for jugong. If you put the so-called Latin term, which is actually a Malay term, jugong, jugong, that's it. There are at least 36 different words for jugong. And each one is a category unto itself that tell, and each word, interestingly enough, if we use the big words of knowledge, also have their own ontology and epistemology. There is no such thing as just a jugong. So we're dealing with a jugong ness. So every one of those 36 words is exploring a quality of jugong ness. And, you know, they defy simple translation, really. You know, that's just one example. But, you know, there are so many others. I, I, I think, again, Yanua, because I know it, but I know that Garua does it next door, and I know that Mara does it next door as well is you're also dealing with what I would call two things. One is you're dealing with kin-centric politics, where the politics of country are determined by kin. And there's a whole vocabulary that talks about how that works. And I mean politics in the highest order. I think it always alarms me a little bit that when politics is taught in universities, there's nothing about Indigenous politics, or if it is, it's about land rights or legislation. You know, we have to be very clear, Indigenous people are political people, and land is held politically. So we've got this idea of kin-centric politics, but then we also have, and the vocabulary around this is huge, but related, you also have kin-centric ecologies, where every living, growing, breathing, and what we might call non-animate thing in country is also kin and has to be related to as kin. So if I give you an example, when I first started learning the language, we went bush, all the men went off hunting, all the women went off hunting, and I was this weird white fella just hanging around the edges, really, and somebody had to look after me. And I was put with a very old lady who I think was a bit disgusted that 
she was made my babysitter. But anyway, she took me for a walk and I carried my little book with me and I wrote down all these words that she gave me. And I thought at the time I was just being given the names for a pandanus palm. I was being given a name for catfish, mangroves, whatever we saw that day. When I got back into the camp, her son came up to me and said, what did my mum teach you? And I started to read out the words and he just doubled over laughing. And he said, you have not learned any words about what to call those things. You have learned how to call them as family, as kin. And it really opened my eyes to this idea of kin-centric ecologies and kin-centrism and, kin and how central it is to understanding country. And as we began this part of the conversation about how language holds it. And English just can't cope. But what we're dealing with then is the problematic of how do we translate? You know, I know enough about Sanskrit too to know that it's an incredibly difficult language to translate because of the nuances that those words can carry. So translation becomes a really, really important issue. And, you know, I look at words that I might have gathered 40 years ago, and I look at the way I translated them then, and I look at the way I translate them now, they're poles apart. Because with an oral tradition, these words are so totally dependent on context at any one time as to how a word is going to be used. Is, I mean, there are many things that stand out, but two things that stand out to me in what you've been saying, and this may go very much to the heart of, of the wisdom embodied in the tradition, but uh, this deep, deep sense of connectedness or oneness, which you find at the heart of so many different wisdom traditions around the world, but this deep sense of connection and oneness. But the other thing is for all of these subtle distinctions, you know, just as you're saying with dugong and etc. but the, the very, very finely honed powers of of attention um, to actually observe subtle differences and and so on that you know it's sometimes said that uh, Eskimos have dozens of different words for snow and I, I dare say because there's this very fine awareness of uh, the powers of observation um, that uh, uh, it's, part of the it's, yeah you're right but I think you know if you were to say how do you express that understanding of awareness. And if we want to start moving into sort of this deeper understanding, like in Yanua, quite often people will say to kids, oh, to anybody that's sort of being too noisy, can't you just sit still and listen to country for a while? Which means to sit really in contemplation. Um, so what are you contemplating? So you're contemplating really what you're seeing and where you fit within all of these different schemes of kin centrism, of the politics of it, of, of the non-human nature of it, of all the different ways that you can be embodied into this place that you call home. And literally the term translates as listening. But if you listen well, the term that would then be used, and you could translate this term as mindfulness, is, listen, is really to be intelligent enough to understand what you are listening to in that quietude. Because if you are involved in such a deeply kin-centric world, part of the issue is you can't afford just to be an egotistical individual because what that listening is trying to teach you is your relationship to everything else both your human kin your non-human kin your country whether that be terra firma or sea or whatever might be present so this whole idea of listening of being mindful is a process of bringing all of that together to find out what you think your place is in all of it. Yes. So it's interesting, this um, 
I mean, mindfulness, of course, is a word that's being used a lot these days. Uh, like in uh, modern life, the need to wake up, to be aware, it's like we're, <laughs> we're sleepwalking much of the time, but it sounds that this, this awareness, this deep connection, this sense of being present goes very much to the heart of what it means to, to live uh, this kind of real embodied life where you, your embodiment doesn't sound like it's separate from the embodiment of the environment, separate from anything, really. Um, it's really well, this. In I think I'd say that's the aim. Yeah. That is the aim. Um, of course, there's great concern in the modern world when, you know, this may not be happening. It's why, you know, older people sometimes are so strident with younger people about, come on, you've got to learn to listen. It's so critical to who you are. And, you know, Indigenous communities are undergoing immense change. And I think, you know, one of those changes is also that there is so much of the Western world, and I use that word West in parentheses, really, that it's not interested in understanding this. Or if it is, it sees it as some kind of exotic add-on as opposed to actually being of real benefit. And it sort of goes to what you were saying then about, well, what is mindfulness? Are we ever really aware? You know, I remember if I just cut back to a, a Buddhist teaching I had where the teacher at the time said to somebody, you can be aware while you are, you can be mindful while you are cleaning your teeth. And that person just didn't get it. Couldn't understand how that would even make sense. And I think we are prone sometimes in the West to be uncomfortable around this kind of thinking, this idea of listening to country, just sitting with it, not having to actually touch, you know, not actually having to physically manipulate anything, just sit with it, be with it. And, you know, and I've seen old men, you know, I have a clear vision in my mind now of five old men sitting on a long rock, looking out the sea, and they sat there for an hour and never spoke once. And then they came back and they looked at me and they just said, that was really good. And you just go, there it is. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of complexity here. We're sort of, it's a stone over the top of the water here. But yeah. Yeah. I suppose complexity, but also perhaps a sense of simplicity, uncomplicatedness at the same time. Now, you, you, you've had a, a more than 40-year interest in um, uh, particularly the Vajrayana um, Buddhist tradition. So how was that uh, particular interest? You, you mentioned you originally heard a bit about when you were a child, the Dalai Lama, and then read a little bit about that. H how did this sort of interest go from more than just a, a curiosity to being an important part of your life as well? Uh... I'll have to go back to my dad again, I think, <laughs> and being left in the Bendigo Library. Um, <laughs> yeah, so when he told me about the Dalai Lama, I thought, I don't know who this fellow is, I know nothing about this. And I was always a bit of a bookish child, I guess. So when mum and dad went shopping in Bendigo, which was the nearest big smoke, I was always deposited in the library. That was where I was put. And in those days, I don't know, there's probably people listening. There was the adult section and there was the kids section and you never crossed over. But anyway... I got brave enough. I went up to this very stern woman, you know, horn rimmed glasses, the whole deal, really. And I said, well, I want to know who the Dalai Lama is. And they said, well, who told you this? Well, my dad. Come with me. You know, so we stepped over the, the magic threshold and she got some big books down. She showed me who that was. And I saw some Im imagery, but there was another image altogether that really caught my attention. And it was actually a sculpture. And I've always been interested in art. So anything sculptural caught me even when I was a kid. And it was an image of a fellow, a very important fellow. You can either call him Guru Rinpoche or Padmasambhava, who was actually said to be the carrier of Buddhism into the Himalayan region. And I was absolutely blown away by this image. I, I actually went to a secondhand bookshop. I scoured secondhand bookshops for years till I found a copy of that book because it's still central to all of this. And I wanted to know more about that person. Well, in those days, you know, there were no Dharma centers. There was nothing, you know, not even in Melbourne. There was nothing. But I was sent to a tech school as a kid. 
it isn't where I should have been sent. But anyway, that's what pharma, that's where pharmacists get sent. And my life really was difficult. And I was saved by three English teachers, really. And in year 11, one of those English teachers led me to a lot of literature, a lot of the classic Western canon. But one day he said to me, you know, there is other ways of knowing. There are other ways of thinking about what goes on the world. You need to read this. And he gave me a book on Buddhism, which is just sitting here, really, um, that was written in a very dry, Germanic kind of writing. And at the time, didn't understand much, but at least it had some pictures I could relate to. But in it was a whole chapter on Guru Rinpoche, on Padmasambhava. And that's where it began. And I sort of tracked this fellow over the years. But I think the important thing to say is you don't get to Vajrayana without going way, 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 way back to begin. It's the same you don't learn indigenous knowledges or expect people to teach you like this. You know, who are you? You know nothing. You're a baby. So you've got to get basic building blocks before you can get to where you think you want to get to. So, you know, any journey into Vajrayana means going back to the Theravadan tradition. You have to. You have to go there because that's where the building blocks are. And then from the Theravadan, you go to the Bodhisattva Yana, which is the middle. And then maybe, you know, if your teacher lets you, the doors might open to Vajrayana. But, you know, this is a long journey. This is a, a big process of acquiring knowledge. And this is where I sit with both the annual ways I have learned and the Buddhist ways, you know, if you want to do it properly, there's no easy road. You know, you become a wanderer for a long, long time. Maybe you're a wanderer for the rest of your life because there's no end to the knowing. And I think the other thing that goes with it is you can read all the books in the world, but unless there's praxis, you get nothing. And I was fortunate in terms of the lineage of Yanua teachers they demanded praxis from me. So you begin to experience that knowledge. And well, of course, in Buddhism, if you can read and read and read, but you're not going to get wise unless there's actually praxis, the doing of what you have to do. So I think those two things for me have traveled together all through my life, that the praxis is fundamental. The doing of, yes, you read and then you come and you contemplate and then you do. Now, in Yanya, of course, you are told, you learn, but then you are expected to, to demonstrate what you have learned, whatever that might be. And I, I see parallels all over the place here in these two traditions. Mm. How much of this um, uh, gaining of wisdom in the Buddhist tradition, and indeed in, in any tradition, is it purely the acquisition of knowledge as information or as much of it also about um, the surrendering of false notions, the examination and surrendering of, you know, wrong ideas, wrong thinking we have about things, ourselves, our place in the world, uh, for example. Is there a kind of a tension between, the, the, well, not tension, but um, this, this sort of difference between taking on knowledge and and the giving up of, uh, of ignorance, as it were? Look, I think you've got to have curiosity. Mm. I think curiosity is fundamental. But if you really want to understand it, and this goes for me both sides, in where my life has gone, you also have to have a degree of fearlessness. I don't know whether that sounds contradictory, but you've actually got to have a degree of absolute curiosity. What the heck is going on? But you've also got to have some fearlessness or even confidence in yourself that it might lead somewhere, but you don't know where. And that's okay. You know, I think, you know, teaching in universities this year, of all years, has taught me that there's a body of students increasingly who think that they should be able to have all the answers now. <laughs> and I find that quite terrifying. But is this where we've got to, you know, that learning should be just this constant, ongoing unfolding. And that's what, for me, Buddhism is. And it's what my Yanyu experience was as well. You cannot ever presume that you can know it all. So you've got to have this curiosity. You, you've got to have a fearlessness because 
both of these traditions are layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of story. And somehow you've got to make sense of that. And that's the, that's the task at all, really, because no one's story is going to fit you perfectly. You know, it's the old story of where the Buddha spoke 84,000 different ways because the Buddha needed to make everybody understand what he was saying. Well, that's the Buddhist side. The Yanua side is a little bit more harsh. There is only one way, and we're going to teach it to you. And don't ever, once you've been taught, feign a position of ignorance because we know we have taught you and it is your responsibility then to know. So, yeah, I think you've got to have curiosity. You've got to have fearlessness. And I think if you do that well, then an awareness develops of what you're up to. Oh, for sure. In the beginning, you're swimming in mud. But, you know, it's um, this deep awareness ha comes out of that curiosity and that fearlessness to actually want to know. So this sort of knowing, like really knowing, quite naturally leads itself to living in accordance with that knowledge. You couldn't really I think, know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I, I think that's the critical point. But that doesn't mean, again, what you know, the question is, what does it mean to live in accordance with? You know, you can walk into any new age bookshop and they would say, well, here we are. We're living in accordance with the Tao or with Buddhism. And you go, I've never seen anything like this. You know, the Buddha never said this, but this is a book about words the Buddha said. Well, no, he didn't. And I think you see the same with indigenous traditions too, where people want it easily. They want the exotic before they want what it's actually grounded in. And I, I'm really loath at the, to, given what, you know, if we talk about lineage, you know, lineage is so critical here. You know, I have a lineage of teachers who have taught me what I know from the Buddhist tradition, and they have a lineage, so you you become an, a, a part of a an immense lineage. But similarly, you know, say in the Yanua context, you don't learn without lineage either. You know, people will say, if, you know, if you express something, people will say, who told you that? And you are expected to be able to say, so-and-so taught me. Oh, yeah, that's right. So either side, lineage is actually important. We're not dealing with things that are just floating around in space that you can just grab hold of and say, you, you now know it. Um, and I think maybe it's my personality. I don't know. But I think for me, that provides a very strong platform in terms of how I learn to understand what I know. Wonderful, John. Um, I'm just um, also uh, conscious that there are some questions that are uh, coming up in the Q&A and possibly the chat. I hope uh, Jess has been keeping an eye on those. And so, John, if you're happy to, would you take some uh, questions that have sure. come up and see what uh, some of our see what's there. participants yep. today are interested in? Jess. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we had a couple come in uh, the chat privately. I thought Cast your mind back, John, to about 10 minutes ago, you were talking um, about the deep listening in our modern world. And you mentioned the non-human nature of things. Yeah. We're wanting to know a little bit more, what is Indigenous people's wisdoms, understanding of the non-material nature of things? Would you have well, some comments on that? At the risk of creating binaries, we're talking about we have humanity, we have human-centred ways of being yeah but in many indigenous communities and i would dare say in vajrayana actually you have to learn to embrace that there is also the non-human and the non-human can impact your life so in a yanua sense non-human uh or the fish or the birds or the snakes or the insects or the rocks or the stones or the trees everything because they are also kin and you actually have to learn how to understand how they are your kin. And this is also a profoundly philosophical but political act as well. This is the extension of human-based kinship into what we might just blithely call the environment. And it's not a metaphor. It's actually real. And those ideas of the kin of this non-human kin-centric world are fundamental to holding country. 
Now, Himalayan Buddhism, for example, because of the way it entered into the Himalayas, also acknowledges very, very early on the notion of non-human and unseen presences in the environment. And I think what is really important here is this idea that the environment is actually important, that the environment is alive. Like one of the texts I recite every day, because it reminds me a little bit of an acknowledgement of country really, is a text from the 1600s written by a Tibetan fellow by the name of Rigzen Yinra Drukpa. But what it is, is a text that acknowledges that our presence in the world is not one that is alone, that there are human ancestors, there are our own kin now, and that we should be careful of all our actions, whether it be chopping trees down, whether it be digging the earth, whether it be moving stones, whether it be careful not to disturb burial places. And it, for me, it's such a profound, it's the one thing I think I've found that is so profoundly links the two together. This idea that there is more than us in this environment. Mm. That's so true. Uh, we, have, we have so many, I'm gonna try to get to a couple more. Um, we have one here. Could you suggest some concepts that have been challenged by your experience of indigenous cultures uh, and what you've learned from them, i.e. the self, progress, knowledge, separate from experience? Yeah, the self, absolutely. Um, you know, I've become a grandfather. I've read kids. You know, we grow them up to want to be strong, individualistic human beings. We think that that's a success story. But if you look at a success story, you know, when I first went to Borolol and worked with Yanua families, success as an individual was knowing how you relate to every other individual in that community, and then eventually, by extension, how you relate to your country. So the ego never gets to be really big, because you'll you'll be chopped down very very quickly. And I think you know I smile now. I think back, you know there were old men and women saw me coming forty five years ago, big time. You know, and a classic example is you know I've always loved animals, and I. As a kid, I knew what a dugong was. I'd never seen one, but I knew what one was because I'd read about them, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I get to Borolola. I'm talking to this old man who hunts dugong, and I say, oh, I know what a dugong is. I've read about them. And he just looked at me with this blank look of, oh, yeah. A year later, I'm in a boat where I get my arm really badly broken by a dugong. Really badly broken. And in that boat is the same man. And in all my agony, he leans over to me and says, now you know Jubal. You know, this is praxis at work. You know, in all its pain and agony, this is praxis. And that old man had not forgotten. You think you know? You cannot know until you have experienced it. And this goes back to the Buddhist story. You cannot know Buddhism unless you are prepared to experience who you are. You know, this is why I love the Tibetan word for meditation, which is gom. Because what it means is to become familiar with yourself, to get to know yourself. That's what the word means. And for me, it's such a powerful thing, you know, that unless you begin to know who you are, you're not going to move. And I think if I take it back to the annual side, they saw me coming and they went, OK, we're going to nail you down to your one inch high then we'll let you grow again. And I think that's how it works. Yes, Scotty says, ego versus eco approach. I quite like that. <laughs> um, we have uh, one from Jason. So in spite of the challenges translating languages, might the essence of certain wisdoms be more fundamental or instrumental in the human experience and more accessible to learn? I think we've got to be really careful. We've got to be really careful in translation that we just don't create. Let me go back a bit. The issue with translation is if we're using English is to try and find English words that fit the words that aren't English. And there's enormous problematics here. You know, if we use the big language, there are enormous ontological and epistemological problems with translation. 
And I have always avowed to not try and make all translation easy. I still think you've got to be able to, even in translation, you've got to be forced to work a little bit so that you really begin to embody what's going on. And I think it's a difficult one because if you've never learned to speak another language, you don't really get it. Again, it's about the praxis of, you know, if you're only, a, and I, I mean, no, nothing bad here, but if you have only all your life spoken English and you've never actually had to enter into another language at all. And let me tell you the, the gap between English and indigenous Australian languages is vast, more vast than French, Spanish, or German, you know, at least you're dealing with languages that sit within the same sort of thinking. So the issue of translation is a critical one and one that we have to embrace. And, you know, I've spoken to Sanskrit scholars and Tibetan scholars, and they will say the same thing, you know, that why should it be easy? You know, if you really want this knowledge, you're going to have to work. And there's no way that you can just create a flattened landscape. I, I, it, it, for me, it's the anathema. If you want to ask me, the anathema in translation is this idea that we create this flat space where everything can be known and all people can have everything at once. It seems to me like sometimes uh, translation could almost be getting a specimen of something, putting it in a museum and saying that's the creature. And sometimes language could almost be like it just fixing it and limiting it and um but that's not that's not the uh, the language at all um you know so much can be lost in in the way things are translated and so much yeah in and the... and especially with indigenous words sure you know and you see this in the sciences a lot you know where they say oh we've got all the indigenous knowledge and when you look at what they've actually captured so often it's just a list you know i, I once went into the field with an ornithologist who captured a list, you know, Yanua name, English name, scientific name for the bird, and said, oh, I've got all the knowledge. There it is. And then an old lady said to him, well, no, you haven't. You haven't got the songs. You haven't got the dances. You don't know what people are able to speak for those species. You don't know what clan it belongs to. You don't know where its ancestral homes are. All you've got is a word. Well, I think, uh, Jess, are we just about up to time? Or we are up to time. time. We have more. so many questions. It depends if John can answer them within a minute. Oh, go on. <laughs> Fine. It's all right. Um, we'll take one more. Take one more. Um, I reckon this one from Lynette. Uh, John, how do you manage to keep so many traditions, the Anua, Buddhism and Judaism within you? And do you think with each of these or is it a bit of compartmentalism? Um, no, I don't like to see it as compartmentalism. I'm actually working on a sculpture at the moment. Art is really important to me. And I've been thinking about this, Lynette. And it's a, a big question for me. And I've actually started to sculpt a plaited a braided rope a rope where the th three parts of the rope are still individualistic and alone but braided together what's going to be at the top of the rope i'm not sure yet but <laughs> i i think about the relationship between these things a lot it, it's a lot of my life and yes they can be alone but it, so often you in your moments of quietude you actually see the links and sometimes they're precarious and they go nowhere and sometimes they're more alive and they actually are worthy of a, a moment celebration of, yeah, there is some similarities here. But I, for me, you know, I, I said earlier on that all of these traditions lead you to be the place of the wanderer. You know, and to be a wanderer is to dwell a lot in uncertainty, uncertainty. You know, nothing certain. You're just moving on, seeing where it all leads. Um, I guess that's where I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> thank you so much, um, John. Uh, look, uh, I, I could have uh, chatted all day, heard more and more of um, 
of your insights and over many, many years of, of passion and commitment and um, it's sort of collected wisdom. So I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everybody who was on this call today about how much we've really enjoyed hearing from you, um, but also just really to respect this lifetime uh, body of work and commitment. And so thank you to you and thank you to everybody. Thank you thank to you. you as well for uh, for joining this uh, this uh, webinar today. It's been uh, fascinating. Thank you.